just never knew how to tell you. I would tell be able to what? talk about my Can life. You what I, I ever loved a lot. I have a two arms. You want me to say it out loud? God. No, being a peacemaker is standing up and drawing your sword and cutting the enemy. So just because we think that we're some kind of mighty army, until we get into the war, until we step into warfare, we really don't know anything. Nicholas West was murdered November 3rd, 1993. When his body was discovered two days later, there was little to suggest the effect the case would have on this conservative East Texas community. 
There were to be three suspects, three separate trials, and a sensational news story of guns, gays, and God. Tyler is a physically beautiful place. It's a fairly wealthy place. It's a religious place. It's a Christian place. The people here have very, very strict black, white standards. Uh, probably one of the toughest places to be convicted of a crime in Texas. Every time we get a call, somebody's dead. I guess it, reality finally started hitting me. Uh, I don't anticipate the phone ring anymore. I dread it actually now. We had a body of a uh, Mexican, uh, partially clothed in a uh, large open wooded area. And it looked like it was gonna be a whodunit. It was gonna look like it was gonna be a who is it. You know, we had no idea who this guy was gonna be. Am I gonna get home tonight? Am I gonna be out all night? Or... But uh, this is pretty much where we ended up. Right in this area here. Uh, it's just it's just clay dirt and. Uh, uh, now when we get here, he's face down. Blood around him. Obviously, he's been shot with bullets. You see the tears in the clothing. G to H represents an entrance to exit wound. Um, I to J represent entrance exit wound. K to L represent entrance exit wound. This is a facial diagram um, showing uh, blunt impact injuries to the face, including an abrasion to the upper part of the nose, and then uh, swelling abrasions and scrapings of the skin. This uh, particular photograph also documents the uh, exit area present below the, ne the, the neck. Uh, this is uh, a gunshot entrance area to the uh, back of the uh, head. Uh, this particular wound is instantaneously fatal. after the murder actually happened. I heard that they had recovered a body at that time. I wasn't for sure exactly who it was. And then the next morning, I discovered that it was Nicholas that they had recovered, that they had found. Did you know him? Yeah. Uh, I had met him uh, at Bergfield Park where um, local gays and lesbians hung out. Uh, it was the only meeting place at the time for gays and lesbians. What do you remember about Nicholas? I remember seeing a young, energetic, guy going through the normal pain of being gay in a conservative area to coming to being very comfortable with who he was, even dealing with his family's rejection to where he felt even comfortable enough on occasion to be out at the park wearing freedom rings, which symboled being gay. Uh, it's pretty, pretty horrendous what, what somebody has done to somebody else. It's uh, upsetting, obviously. This is the way Mr. West looked when I initially viewed him before doing the autopsy. We were sitting here watching the house, and uh, the first person we saw come to the house and go in was Donald Aldridge. 
15 minutes maybe went by and uh, Henry Dunn drove up to the house and went in. Uh, the person that we thought was Henry Dunn, which turned out to be. So I told my partner, I said, you know, I swear that was Henry Dunn and Donald Aldridge that just walked by behind us. Three men were arrested for allegedly killing West because he was gay. Donald Aldrich, David McMillan, and Henry Dunn. Last year, Aldrich was sentenced to die for his role in the crime, but in a videotaped confession, Aldrich said Henry Dunn fired first. Investigators soon realized they had a hate crime on their hands. Well, I, I don't know that I've ever arrested somebody that, that uh, has, has come out and said, you know, that, that we were getting off to uh, the fag bashing and the gay bashing and, and going out and finding the queers, as he put it, and, uh, and taking them out and beating the crap out of them and robbing them, taking their money, putting them out on the side of the road. Uh, Donald was really, he would really, he was getting, getting back, when you, he would talk about the gay bashings, he was just, seems like he was really getting off to talking about what he did to them. He, he enjoyed talking about it and telling you, you know, how much he hated them and how much he liked beating the crap out of them. They tried saying the CB gang was a gang. It wasn't a gang, it was just a bunch of people that hung out. when I was in court. Do you like that picture of yourself? This one? Yeah. I like that one better than all the other ones. This serious side of me. I mean, like now, I got my new lawyer. I haven't heard from him in, since November. How many months is that? Of last year. About seven. So. Then I got some more pictures. That's the prosecutor. David Dobbs. Do you like David Dobbs? David Dobbs, okay. He's okay. And he got you the death sentence? Yeah. He said he was just doing his job. McMillan is the last of three men to stand trial for the 1993 murder of Nicholas West, partly because he was gay. Now, Rebecca Mullins joins us live from Smith County's courthouse. Rebecca, we've already two men on death row for this murder. What role did McMillan allegedly play? Well, Bob, McMillan's own defense attorney says his client is guilty of aggravated robbery and kidnapping and says he was there when West was murdered, but he says he's not guilty of capital murder. Previous evidence has shown that the 24 entry and exit wounds in West's body came from co-defendants Donald Aldrich and Henry Dunn's guns. However, McMillan can be convicted of capital murder under the law of parties. Donald Aldrich was a lot older than uh, McMillan and, and Dunn. And Dunn, he was just a cold-blooded guy that would do anything. Aldridge, 
Uh, he didn't care, and I think Macmillan just kind of wanted to be a part of something and, and a follower. Got arrested when I was 17, and now I'm 20. All the golden years are gone. What does it feel like, Jeff? On trial for my life. It's scary. It's one of the scariest things I've ever been in. What do you expect to happen? I mean, I'm, you know, I'm going to trial. You know, it's up to the jury. It all depends on how the evidence comes out. Like after we got arrested down in, uh, I, think, I think it was Houston, those other teenagers got arrested for killing that, that gay man with a the bat. They were charged with Catholic murder and the judge dropped it. You know, I mean, you know, that's what I'm saying. You know, just different people got different opinions about it. Initiated. It was just something somebody said something about doing one night, and we all went and done a couple, and it just kind of gradually picked up from there. Done a couple of what? Gay bashings. That's what they call them. Most time we would go to the coffee shop, then we would go like mess with people all the time, fighting, robbing people, stuff like that. Rest of my life. I mean, I'm a, I'm a straight guy. You know, I've I've never you know had any homosexual dealings, never done anything homosexual. You know, and you know if if that's the way they want to be, you know, there ain't nothing we can do about it. You know, if, if they want to be homosexual, you know, they're homosexual. Put on that chair the wall there, David has confessed to the police on at least two occasions, one on video and one on an audio tape, that he was there and that he had at some point some participation in the abduction and the death of Nicholas West. Uh, my name is Bill Genk, I'm a detective with the Tyler Police Department. This interview is with David Ray McMillan. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm sure his heart is beating real fast in his chest at, at that point. He's saying, you know, am I going to be able to get out of this? Am I going to, they're going to take me as a witness, give me immunity from prosecution? I don't know what he's thinking at this point. Okay, Nicholas West? That's him? Okay. Um, could you tell me the details that you're aware of in this case? This is McMillan talking to the detective. Is this confidential? No one else will see this. And the detective says, this is between you and me. This is between you and me. And the, the defense is, is going to try to make a, a large argument about that, 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 that McMillan thought that this was just going to be between them, and he didn't really voluntarily waive his rights. But if you, if you, if you go back into the, into the statement, you look more at, at what he says. He says things like, a, But you want to tell us this because these facts are true and accurate. Is that right? Yes. I need to get this shit off my chest. Okay. And in getting this off your chest, is there uh, anything else that you want to tell me? Why do people give confessions? Good question. They don't have lawyers to tell them not to, usually. Many times I think they just want to get it off their system. I mean, they just know they did something they want to tell about it. 
I want to talk about it. Mr. Wes, I'm Betty Witt and I work for Mr. Skeen, the Smith County District Attorney's Office. Uh, Mr. Skeen would like for you to come in this afternoon, if at all possible, after 3 o'clock. He would like to visit you about the Macmillan trial that will start tomorrow. Betty Whitten, W-H-I-T-T-E-N. I'm the victim's rights coordinator. Okay, thank you so much. Bye. He's going to call back. One of them's his gun. He's shooting a short 410. He's got a shotgun shell in his car when they're arrested that matches to the other 410. I mean, right. He's just, he's up in it to his eyeballs. Exactly. You know you're going to go to the penitentiary. But for how long? But for how long is the question. And that's that's what this exercise, this trial is about, is to see how long you go to the penitentiary. And uh, since you get an automatic life sentence anyway, which is 40 years, uh, if, you, if you're found guilty, you really have little to lose, don't you? Yeah. They've offered a life sentence for murder, not capital murder a life sentence for murder, and a life sentence for aggravated robbery. So a savings of 10 years, is it? You run the risk of uh, going for that when a jury may have given you less. So he's been informed of, uh, of his options and uh, he's been asked to consider it carefully. Is this feasible? Is this something that you might consider? Yeah, he might. Yeah, it's feasible. He might right. consider. If yeah. you tell me that, then, then we've got something we can at least talk to Mr. West at about if, if you've got a good faith belief, your client will, will at least consider it. If he's saying, forget it, I don't want to bother Mr. West with it. Well, obviously, I'm not going to discuss uh, you know, what me and my client talk about, no. but I, I'm sure that he will uh, consider any reasonable offer that you might make. We'll consider it. Okay. You know, I just have to talk to see whether we want to even talk to Mr. West about it. I think y'all could probably figure on a trial. I don't think there's actually most realistic prospect of working out any of those agreements we were talking about as being proposals. I anticipate we're going right on with evidence in the morning. The jury is gonna know uh, that the other two defendants have got the death penalty already. Well, the jury's gonna know that. Uh, that can play into our hands, though, in that uh, you can uh, you can hint around to the fact that, look, two people are already on death row for this thing. Why don't you cut this boy some slack? He's not the main actor. He's out there. He don't know. Uh, he's not the bad boy. These two, two people are already dying over it. Uh, matter of fact, this guy is such a minor player that the government hasn't even sought the death penalty against him. So you can play two people on death row into your favor, and that's what we intend to do. <laughs> Originally, it was just a group of kids from adolescent age up to the thir in their 30s uh, that talked on the Citizens Band radio for entertainment. They would meet over the radio and and then eventually meet in person, talk on the phone, and whatnot. So uh, your handle was sure shot. Where'd you get that? I got that from. One of my first girlfriends. I guess you'd say sex partners. Who's Sundance? Is that his daughter? Donna Aldrich. Do you know how to spell that name? D O N. While I was at Pie Pies, I got more or less rehooked back up with Jesse. And they wonder why they call me Dragon. Jesse was on the CB, so I got back on the CB. A lot of them hanging out and talking. I, I just talked on the CB for the longest, and everyone's like, well, you know, who is this guy? Let us meet him. So one night after work, I went uptown. I kind of met everybody, and it just turned into a thing where everybody hung out together. Sundance Kid, that's what we called him. Me and, me and Don talked about it. it's not so much gay bashing as it is robbery. When we were 15, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old, the thought of, of going out and finding a rich homosexual and beating him up and taking his money and his jewelry, uh, that thought's crossed. We never did it. So I never did. I don't know if he did or not.
I never did. And may I be struck by lightning if I'm lying. They had started out in September, later part of the summer, uh, doing gay bashing robberies. And it started out being this little pushing, shoving, roughing up. It escalated to uh, beating with baseball bats and, and uh, boards. Uh, then it uh, went on above that to uh, having guns fired at people. Up to, of course, Nicholas West losing his life. This was the headquarters, I guess, for, for lack of a better word, of the, uh, of the CB gang. Uh, Jed Davidson's home. Well, David McMillan had a small radio in his car. And I said, oh, you talk on the radio? He says, yeah. I said, well, what's your handle? He said, they call me Sure Shot. And that's when we started to meet and everything. He looked, sounded, and, and worked at Brookshire's. He was a Brookshire's All-American boy, but he had that, that shiftiness about him. He did have a side of him that was just, you know, his, he was always wanting to go and do something, find somebody, this, that, and the other. And, and that wasn't me, and it, at the time it wasn't Don. Uh, I guess that changed. Well, Donald said that gay people had more money on them than just regular people, which, you know, I had never really known because I had never really been around gay people before. Um, they call it fag bashing. They call it what? Fag bashing. Fag bashing? Mm -hmm. Okay. People who know the gay community know about Burkefell Park. Okay. And they know that it's a cruisy area, meaning that the people, the guys would go down there to meet other people, which in my my opinion is probably a little bit dangerous. We are in the heart of the Bible Belt and we're not accepted very well at all. <laughs> For Capita, I would consider it a pretty large gay community here in town uh, for Tyler in, in East Texas, but uh, most everybody's in the closet. So we just live a secret life here. It's pretty much at your own risk. Yeah. Uh, anytime you go to uh, any of the public parks or areas such as that, um, you, you never know who you're gonna talk to or meet. You know. You, you don't know if it's going to be uh, somebody genuinely gay that's wanting to find somebody in the gay community or if it's going to be a gay basher. What did you think was going to happen that, that evening? I didn't know. I didn't know. It was just but, another evening when you were going out. Yeah, I mean, we hadn't planned to hurt anybody. I mean, like the prosecutor, they said we plan to go out and get somebody and kill somebody. That's not how it was. When we went up to the park, we was just waiting for Don to get off the phone. We hadn't planned that. We hadn't even planned to go out that night. When you go to a gay hangout, you're driving around, if they see somebody they want to talk to or they think they might be interested in, they'll either flash their headlights at you, turn them on, turn them off, or they'll hit their brake lights. If you're coming up behind them, they'll just touch the brake pedal, let you know they want you to stop and talk. If you're interested, you stop and talk. There would be as many as 20 or 30 people on a given night hanging out making the block around the park. It's in a residential neighborhood and one, in one of Tyler's nicer neighborhoods. And a lot of people would stop and talk and you know sit on the back of tailgates and stuff just as straight people. So we had Don went and picked the guy up. He went up to the guy. He was sitting in the truck. He would go up to this car. And I would see him talking to the dude. And then he would pull a gun on the dude. Dude gets scared. He'll tell me the car that we was in, follow him in it, and we would drive somewhere, and he would take the dude's car, lead the dude out there. How long had you known Nicholas? Just that night. I'd, see, I'd seen him up at the park a couple of times. What was he thinking you would be doing then? 
going somewhere and spending some time together. He thought just, he was doing it just as a regular pickup, finding somebody to go spend some time with before he went home. So we got in the truck. I got in the truck with him. We start up one road. He tells me I can take my jacket off and get comfortable. I start to take my jacket off. And I said, well, do I want to do this or not? I said, may as well go ahead and get it over with. So I pulled my gun, aimed it at him. He threw his hands up in the air, kind of freaked out. I told him, put his hands down, just keep driving, not to worry about it. He does what I say, he wouldn't get hurt. Somewhere in between the park and, and Montgomery Wards, Donald Rogers pulls a pistol out. Obviously, at that point in time, it's uh, pretty apparent that this is not going to be a night of pleasure for Nicholas. So he starts driving. I said, do you have any money on you? He says, yeah. Pulls it out of his pocket and gives it to me. I said, do you have a wallet? He says, yeah, it's under the seat. I said, OK, pull it out and hand it to me. He reaches under the seat. I'm thinking, dang, he could come out with a gun. I said, bring your hand out slowly. So he brings his hand out slow, and he hands me the billfold. I said, now the two guys in that car that you were talking about? He says, yeah. I said, drive back down to them. Those are my buddies. So we drive back down there. He pulls up next to him. I roll down my window, and I says, this truck you said you wanted? And Henry says, yeah. I said, Let's go to Montgomery Wards. has seen David McMillan since they were first arraigned three years ago. So this should be an interesting reaction when he sees him for the first time in the courtroom. He's very intelligent. He's very articulate. He uh, has a good personality. Seems to be a caring human being. I know all that's contradictory to that confession and what happened, but that's how, how he strikes you after being with him a long time, a lot, lot of time. And did he do the killing? They proved it to the jury's satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt. Do you waive that right, and would you like to proceed to testify in this cause, or do you assert the matters as contained within the statement that your counsel has previously submitted to the court? I go with the papers my counsel submitted and plead the fifth. At this time, I'll read that into the record. I, Donald Lauren Aldrich, having been duly advised of my United States and Texas constitutional and statutory rights by my attorney, Sam Griffith, do hereby state that I decline to testify in the case of the state of Texas versus David McMillan. If I am called to testify, I will claim my right against self-incrimination enunciated in the Fifth Amendment. Don is more or less, you know, I try to say he don't pose, he, the guy was gay, the West guy was gay. Don was both ways, so I can't, you can't tell me that he done it because the guy was gay. I don't care if a person's gay or straight, don't bother me. Are you gay? I'm bisexual. I have been since I was about eight years old. You met old Richard's home? Yes, yes. Well, I sat and talked to him at Birdsville Park for, you know, almost an hour, I guess. He come up on his bicycle. He, he had a bicycle. I remember seeing the bicycle. You know, parked it right next to the tree. We sat under for almost an hour and talked. And, and I was really shocked myself when I found out he's the one that was involved in Nicholas's murder. You know. I mean, the, the, as, soon as, I, as soon as I heard the name, it was like, oh, my God. You know, I sat and talked to him. He was trying to pick me up, so to speak. You know, is it some kind of mental thing that he has that, you know, he, he himself could very well be gay, and then, but he hates the fact that he is, and he wants to 
you know, he hates all the other guys because of it. I first got involved with sex with my cousins, and then I was done by my older brother and my older cousin, and that carried on for a few years. And then with the few friends that were kind of into a lot of the same stuff, it just kind of carried on. I don't know when he was young, I guess. He uh, didn't have, how should I put it, much family support. So. Did you become like a mother too? Mm -hmm. Yep. So I don't believe that he done any of it. I believe that uh, he is taking the blame for the other because the black guy had threatened to kill a guy the week before and Don stopped him. So I know that. And they, Don made a statement that he done it all, but I don't believe it. He told me what happened as much as he could because, of course, they were listening to his phone call. But he told me, you know, that he was picked up walking down the street and he invited Mr. West to go with him. I don't know, I wasn't there. And that Mr. West made an advance towards him and that's when it got personal. And whether I believe the media, whether I believe everybody else, I don't know whether I believe Don. Take Nicholas out of the truck, put him in the car with David and Henry. We're debating on what do we want to do with him? Where do we want to take him to and drop him off? We can take him to Bellwood and drop him off, but the cops are out there quite a bit because of a few gay bashings. Take him out to Headache Springs, but the house is too close. It's all he's got to do is raise a little bit of hell and have people calling the cops. David said something about going out to the pits. I said, that'll work. I said, take him out there. I said, by the time he gets himself untied from a tree and walks back into the nearest phone, we can already be in Dallas. So whose car was Weston? He was in the car with us. Yeah, with who? With M me and David. What was the, what, what were you talking about while you were in the car? Nothing. I mean, I told the dude, I said, I, I'm not even going to hurt you because I don't even know you. I mean, David, he just sitting there looking at him, driving. What could have been going through his mind for that ride from Burkeville Park to Noonday, Texas, which is about a 15 or 20 minute journey? Am I going to see my parents? Am I going to see my brothers and sisters? Am I going to see my friends? Am I going to get to go home tonight? Uh, am I going to die? Am I going to live? And that was all in the control of three people, Dunn, McMillan, and Donald Aldridge. I couldn't remember exactly where the pits were. I'd only been out there once or twice. Uh, I'm going through the truck waiting on them to show up. They finally pull up next to us, and we kind of go through the truck on the side of the road, drive on up to the pits. They were placing themselves on the same level of God and saying, I've got control over your life and death. That I'm going to be the one that decides whether you live or whether you die, whether you walk out of here or whether you crawl out of here, whether you go to the hospital or whether you go home. I mean, they're the, they're the ones that had that decision. Uh, Nicholas West had no control over what he was going to do. I mean, the only decision he had to make was whether I'm going to I'm going to fight whether I'm not going to fight, but they were the ones that decided whether he was going to live or whether he was going to die. And then to be taken out with three guys with guns, oversized, Nicholas much smaller than them, wondering if that miracle person was going to walk out of those dark woods and save him, and it didn't happen, and these people showed no mercy on him.
Don said we, Aldrich said we was gonna scare him. I mean, that's all we were supposed to do was scare him. David's still back in his car. I turn around, I said, David, you coming? He said, yeah, hold on a minute. I don't know what he was doing. He was messing with something under his dash. May have been on the CB, I don't know. Mr. Aldridge was a very manipulative man. He didn't hesitate. When I just asked him, I said, are you coming or not? He said, yeah, hold on a minute. He finished messing with what he was messing with, reached down, grabbed the 410, started up the hill with us. You didn't, you didn't force him to, to go? No, I did not. He wasn't forced, made to do anything. He could have he said, no, I want to stay in the car. That would have been fine. He could have stayed in the car. I wouldn't have cared. That hey, 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 man, if he wanted to, he, he, he could tell somebody to go and get bridge. <laughs> Serious, that, that man was very manipulative. He, he, he could just talk to you and get you to believe in. And about this point here uh, is when they, uh, they really started first accosting him. Uh, they made him take his clothes off, his pants off, uh, his shoes. Uh, they went through his pockets, they emptied his pockets out. Uh, we found items from his uh, uh, front pockets thrown here on the ground uh, and along up the, up the hill. Okay, so you start walking up this hill. So you uh, leave your vehicles at one position yeah. and go up a hill. You walk around the side, you walk straight up the deal. Okay, and then what happened? No. As you're walking, was he, was the man saying anything? No. Uh, okay, at some time, he lost control of his balls. When was that? I'm not really sure. Okay. Um, at some time, was, was Mr. Dunn or Mr. Aldrich or yourself saying anything to this man? Uh... I mean, it's hard for me to believe somebody's going to basically walk almost to their death here. Well, I mean, they, they were telling you just to keep on walking. Okay. They finally, you know, just keep on walking. Just, just keep on. Don't turn. Look back or nothing. And they had the guns aimed at him the whole time? Did one person have both guns? Um, walking up the hill, Don had the 410. Don okay. had a 410. Don had a 410 sometime in his hands. Yes. Don will hit him, and then we, went, we walked from the cars all the way up to two clearings. I don't remember who it was. If it was David or Henry. One of the two noticed that Nicholas West had defecated on himself. It was kind of a joke. David tells him to take his pants off, giving him a hard time. I said, no, we ain't got time for all this. By this time, Nick West is in nothing but a pair of underwear and his sock feet, because they'd thrown everything away. And then, when they walked up to, to the second clearing, we got up there, and me, Donald, and David, they were still messing with him because he used the bathroom in his pants. We got up to the top. Henry tried fighting Nicholas. Nicholas wouldn't fight. I told him to go ahead and make it quick. I just wanted to get it done. Henry Dunn hits him and says, come on, fight me, fight me. You know, gives his gun to, to Donald Aldridge and says, hold the gun. Here, I'm going to fight this guy. I want to fight me. I think he says, I'm going to fight me a fag, you know. And Dunn hit him. And, you know, there's a, we found a little mark on the autopsy where he had been hit in the eye. Yeah, I said, you either going to beat me up or I'm going to beat you up. And he said, but I don't want to fight. He said, because I don't know how. I said, well, I don't know how to fight that good either. So Nicholas decides not to fight. And Henry's not getting his satisfaction. He's not getting what he wants. He like acted like he was gonna hit me, so I hit him first. And then after he wouldn't hit me no more, so I just forget it. And when we back, and when I fired up in the air, that's why I mean, that's when everything, you know, went out of hand.
beginning it was just a murder. And then evidence started surfacing that this was actually a hate crime and that the victim was targeted because he was gay. They had targeted gays since September for sure. That's people that felt comfortable enough with going to the police. I can promise you there's many of cases that never were reported to local law enforcement that these people had victimized. If they had not been caught, this was just the beginning of many gay murders in the area. When I was growing up, it was the black people. It was accepted to mistreat them or go out and do the same towards blacks. But now gays are an easy target because they teach that gays are, are bad. And so I guess they feel some justification in doing it to us. It's an event that will, um, will truly bond these girls to Tyler forever. I think that the evidence shows that they were looking for easy victims for robbery. So you're making pretty good money? Mm, yeah. Like how much? You might get five, six hundred dollars for a car. It depends on what kind it is. But um, I mean, if you get a real good car, you get like two thousand dollars for it. We buy like clothes, gold rings, necklaces, all types of stuff like that. I got along okay with my family as far as up until my dad left. And that's when everything kind of went rocky. And um, he left when I was in going to the 10th grade, 9th or 10th grade. I was like 16. I hardly ever saw him. He's a disc jockey at a radio station, at KZY radio station. It's AM station. All he's crazy about rap. He's, he's, he's a rap fan. He, he looks pretty well like a variety, but he's, he's a rap fan. I guess most young kids are you know, crazy about that stuff. I never have. Really, I can't understand most of it. So. He didn't play around with guns as a child. Uh, we never, to my knowledge, never even bought him a water gun. I had you know, been told about some people he was running with, but as far as the magnitude of what they were doing or what they were involved in, you know, I had no idea. But it was a total shock to me when I found out about it. Do you think that he shot Nicholas West? No, I don't. I don't really think he shot him. I won't say he, he would, may have not have fired a shot out there, but as far as walking up to him and, and putting the gun to his head, pulling the trigger, I really don't think he did it. And I'm not saying it just because he's my son. I just don't think he, he could do it. This guy Aldridge that had said, you know, they either do what he tell them, or, you know, it could have been him down on the ground getting shot. So, you know, in a situation like that, you just don't know. You don't know what caused him to do it. I can't say Henry was a person that had any animosities, anything toward gay people because he had a friend that was gay and you know, they always got along real close. Cause what they get is one big surprise. Oh, this microphone sounds like shit and I'm bitter. like getting spanked, bend me over with the music cranks. You can slap my bottom, make my butt cheeks go insane, and I don't mind if there's a little pain. They've been pain. trying to, okay, uh, was it gay and lesbian marriages? Nah, I can't agree with that. I, I can't agree with them whenever they say, you know, that God made them that way. You know, because why is God going to, you know, make something contrary, you know, to what the Bible says?
these kids, Donald Aldridge and even Henry Dunn and uh, David McMillan in this one isolated instance with Nicholas West, they were not born haters, they were taught to hate. In their spree of violence before the murder of Nicholas West, they would literally load up in the back of trucks at local high schools and ask who wants to go fag bashing. I mean, they were taught that it was okay to go to Burkeville Park, you know, that those people were lesser and were weaker and, and that's why they were targeted. Being a peacemaker is not putting up with these people with their vile mouths sitting behind you, cursing God. No, being a peacemaker is standing up and drawing your sword and cutting the enemy. So just because we think that we're some kind of mighty army, until we get into the war, until we step into warfare, we really don't know anything. See, when the church starts getting militant, the world starts getting nervous. Help me to realize that the enemy, if the enemy comes into my life, it's an opportunity for me to kick his butt. I was very sad, you know, when I heard about it. I mean, about the murder, I was just like, you know, you think in small town in Tyler, gosh, that couldn't happen, you know, but I mean, that's just, that's what the devil wants to do. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You know, that was a life that a price was paid for, that guy that got killed. There is a homophobic thing, you know, and people are afraid, but we need to understand that it is a sin. I don't believe we need to compromise with that. I believe the church should stand bold about what the Bible says and declare the scriptures because it's only the truth of the scriptures that will set people free. See, God doesn't count homosexuality any different than any other sin. The sin of overeating or the sin of, you know, whatever, you know, and so God, just like God has delivered me, He can deliver them. And really, I, I don't even think that we should use the term gay. Most of the people I know that are in that lifestyle are the furthest thing from gay. They're sad. They're lonely, they're forlorn, they're looking for acceptance, they're looking for love, and I want to tell you it's found in the Lord Jesus. We're saying that the lifestyle is, according to Scripture, it's ungodly, and there is a lying spirit that has entered into these people that says, well, I, I became like this, I was born like this. It's not true. It's, it's, an, it's a spirit that has entered into them because they did not want to retain God in their mind. Yeah, the devil was in him. Of course he was in him. It's a demon spirit that caused him to be a homosexual. The murder of Nicholas West is uh, one incident among thousands of incidents that happen uh, every month in this country. Uh, this country is full of that sort of violence. And it's because we've abandoned a moral base and a moral foundation. We have none. It's do what you want to do. This is called a 410. This is the same kind of gun that uh, uh, Macmillan had uh, at the scene out there. If he wanted to take that little bush out there, he could probably have done it with, with one like this. It's uh Nice country folk, I grow with guns. 22s, 410s, shotguns, 3030s, 30-06s. Guns are just almost an everyday thing, you know? He's so petrified, he don't know what to do. He don't want to kill anybody. He don't want anybody to get killed. He doesn't know at that point that they're going to kill West. What is he going to do? So he has to play along with them. And obviously, that's the spin you put on it. I think if Nicholas West would have had a, a gun on him, he probably wouldn't be dead today. Do you know, having known Dunn, where he got that weapon from? And what kind of weapon was that? The problem there, the, that's his father, that's David's father's pistol that was used in the, in the murder that the Dunn used. A 357 revolver that, that uh, David had taken from his house. It was his dad's gun. Okay. A revolver, okay. And then the other weapon was a... Um, the other one that they had was a 410. A 410 shotgun? Yeah, that's all. They had. How long was it? Can you show me just with your hands? Not that long, Mr. Grip, no. Okay. With a pistol grip? Um, was it a pump shotgun? Just a little 410, single, bolt action, and it had black tape all the way around it. 
Okay, so it's a single action, or single shot bolt action, I'm sorry. What's the relevance of that shot? Uh, Curry's just, he's leaving the impression that somehow this gun is chambered for a, for a shell that's a different size of this one. He probably doesn't know what in the hell he's talking about, but it at least has me nervous enough that I want someone to take a look at it. Just like that. I used to get guns all the time just because I like them. I mean, I used to like get them and set them up. I had a little 25, I kept under my pillow. I had the 22, which I kept in the corner by my bed. So, I mean, I didn't take them and use them on people because I didn't know anything about that then. To me, shooting a gun's no different than making a cake. It's just something I do with my hands. So this gun here is a is something that you can hit what you want to hit with at a long distance. That's the one that's done yet, right? Well, one similar to this. Is it easy to get a gun? Yes. Real easy. I mean, you can buy street guns all day for like $20, 30 dollars. That's it. And this is perfectly legal. Uh, then when you want to shoot it, you cock the hammer back, and then you just, and then that shot one barrel, then you pull it back again, shot the other barrel. So this is, this is a good weapon, and just for close up, obviously it's empty now, and you never want to point a gun at anybody, whether it's empty or not, but you know, this is the type of gun you'd just pull out of your pocket and just shoot somebody up close with if they were attacking you. You wouldn't want to try to hit somebody a long ways off or something like this. I got a gun from a guy named Terrence Wallace, and it was like the end of November, right before we got arrested. So I didn't have it long. <laughs> Me and Henry, when we came out of the club, we got shot at. You hear the gun go off, and you hear this something fly by you and hit something. You actually the bullet so close that you hear it go by. And like, hey, let's get out of here. You may run or what have you. And it's just the fact that. You know that you was just a target of something, and nothing happened. It's kind of like doing drugs. Do a shot of uh, methamphetamines or cocaine, you get that rush. It's kind of a high. What's the feeling like when you shoot a gun? Mm. If you like loud noises, you like it. I mean, loud noises. See, because I like loud noises, the bang. That's, I guess I like big guns, or the ones that shoot a lot of times. Everybody just started shooting. Went crazy. Everything just got out of hand, you know. That's how he got killed. Henry took the gun from Sundance, pulled it out of his hand, and shot the guy. Okay, where did you shoot him at? All over. I mean, how many times did you shoot him? Six times. Okay, is that empty of that particular gun? Yes. Okay, did, did what did he do with the shells to that gun? I don't know. Did he throw the shells out? Did he reload the gun? I don't know. It was quick. Like how quick? Go boom, boom. I mean, yeah, boom, 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 boom. Yeah, quick. I mean, it was like two, sounding, sounding like two and three shots at one time. So. I thought he was just trying to scare the guy some more, so I fired a shot off myself. Henry took a couple of more shots. When I realized he was shooting at him, that was when I turned to leave. When I turned to leave, I fired a shot off, and it went straight into the ground. I told him I wasn't any part of that, and I left. When Henry decided he was going to kill Nicholas West, I was already in the truck headed down the road. You're already in the truck? But I thought you said that Henry beat you down to the bottom of to, to the cars. I thought you had said in your, in your confession... Not, not, not with Nicholas West. Yeah, you said that he started running. Give me a minute. 
See, we were out there at the deals three times. One time I left before everybody else. One time, give me a minute. No, I guess he did beat me on the one with West because I got in the truck and he got in David's car. Give me a second. You got me trying to remember too much right now. You know, when I, I stop, I, I try not to think about them days period too much. He shot nine times. Six times he walked up to me, I think. What part of the section you point to it? I don't know. I was running. First shot, I was, I was young. I didn't want to, I, you know, I... Did you actually see him shoot the guys up? Yes, I... I turned back to the did run off the first shot? No, I don't, I don't believe he ran after the first I, shot. He wouldn't have the knowledge I, that he shot the guy in the head if he'd been turning around and running rest. after the first shot. Then how did he know he walked up and shot him in the back of the head with a six shot? I like shooting a watermelon, you know. Just, you know. So that was a shot in his head? Yes. And it sounded like a watermelon being shot? Yeah. Okay, when you're saying shot, you mean struck with the actual bullet? Yes. So you heard and saw then the bullet yes. strike this man yes, in the I head? Did. And this come, came from whose hand? This came from Henry Dunn's hand. Okay. They said that the person that done the headshot walked directly up on him and put the gun up to his head and, and fired it, which I didn't do that. No, but you, you, you admitted in your confession, right, that you shot him from three or four feet. At, at, well, yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean. At the end. That was the yeah. last shot that was fired, right? It was about three or four feet from him. That's not a headshot. No, I know. But the one which went, that's the one which went in his head. Could have. But at direct angle it was at, that was not the shot I fired, because it was going straight down. Well, who do you think did that? I don't know. And like my lawyer said, somebody had to go back up there for the simple reason. None of the bullet shells was found, none of that. Got a, you've got premeditation, uh, you've got them going out and, and hunting their victim and laying in wait for their victim and doing not just the murder but the torture, the robbery, the beating, the taunting. That's, you know, that's a justification for the capital punishment. This is the Texas Death House. All executions are carried out here. At the Walls Unit, uh, we uh, have carried out two executions this year. Uh, Nineteen were carried out last year. This is the cell where the inmate would be placed uh, prior to the execution, anywhere from six to eight hours. Should he have a visitor while he's here, he'd be placed in this cell with a wire mesh over it so there'd be no uh, contact between the two. The shower, an in inmate is afforded the opportunity to shower. Uh, most do, uh, then change into a, a clean set of clothes. The appointed hour, they're, they're walked into the actual execution chamber and uh, told to get on the gurney. They're then placed on their back, strapped at the ankles, the leg, the abdomen, and the chest. And their arms are outstretched and strapped at the wrist. An IV is inserted into each arm, and uh, the inmate is then uh, ready for execution, and the witnesses are called for. It's against the law to murder somebody, but then they make a law that brings you down here to death row it makes it legal for them to kill you, which is not gonna bring the person that's gone back. But, yeah, and still they make a law that says they can kill you. Gives the right for somebody else to stick a needle in your arm and kill you, bust your heart. It's wrong. If murder is wrong, it's wrong. It shouldn't be no law that says it's right. What do you feel about dying here? The sooner the better. My life's been a mess since I was a kid. If they kill me, they kill me, they're doing me a favor. If they don't, I'll just live until I die. 
I don't have a death wish, but if you're tired of what you got and you want to make a change, next life's got to be better than this one's been. Am I scared of dying? No, I'm not scared of dying. Did you kill Nicholas West? Did you kill Nicholas West? No. Did not even shoot him. I don't know that the death penalty is a deterrent. Do you believe in that? Absolutely. For what reason? Retribution. Uh, you're looking at a person who's had nine, minimum of nine gunshot wounds, and shot all over the body. Uh, and then David McMillan, with his shotgun, he fires once. And it does strike Nick West, but it doesn't penetrate him and doesn't, uh, uh, it's not the type of wound that would have caused his death. He's not a killer. He's a kid that got in with a bad crowd. Therefore, you should find him not guilty. What else can you do? When you know, there's, there's a lot of things that you never know is gone to his gun. You know, you, you never know how, to, how the mud feels in between your toes, the sounds of the birds, a dog barking. You never know how, 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 how it sounds or how good it is until it's taken away from me. And then you realize. I mean, I, I, think, I think it's been what? It was two and a half years before I heard, I heard a, a bird. And I, I, I've still yet to hear a dog bark. You know what I mean? You know, just little things that, you know, everybody used to take pleasure in. Now it's, it's just history. Yeah, sure, when I hit the pen, I'll hear a dog bark, but it's not the kind that's going to come play with fetch with you. You know, it's the kind that's going to come rip your leg off. They're going to know that David McMillan is not this innocent little blonde haired blue eyed kid who just got misled by Aldridge and Dunn. They're, they'll convict him and he'll be lucky that we're not asking for the death penalty. Um, he'll be lucky, unlike Nick West, who was not lucky. You know, they left him to bleed to death, if not already dead, from the final gunshot to the back of the head. I mean, nobody went home and felt guilty and said, hey, I'm gonna go back out there and make sure he's okay and see if he's okay. Nobody went back, nobody told about it, nobody checked on him. They left him for dead, as far as they was concerned. They left him in an isolated gravel pit, face down, filled with bullets. I mean, I've actually cried since I've been locked up, more than once. So. Do you cry, Who? Are you, why were you crying? What a simple fact, I'm locked up. And then I think, like when I first got locked up, I would think about it. I would cry then. I mean. About being locked up? No. I would cry about him getting killed. I mean, it was something that wasn't supposed to happen. Some, I didn't know him. He hadn't done nothing to me. So why did you kill him? I mean, it just happened. Like well, I said, I it wasn't supposed to when happen. When you say it just happened, well, I, I mean, know, I know it, it, it happened, got out of so control, yeah. It was something that wasn't supposed to happen. It just, things got out of control. It went too far. You were playing and then it went over the edge? It went, went too far. What, what do you miss most about being in here? I miss sex. I've loved sex since I was a kid. If they would put me on a, on, a, on a unit with a bunch of women and I could have sex, they could keep me for the rest of my life. They would put me out here with a bunch of these men, forget that. 
I'm not into men, I'm into women. After, you know, this thing happened, you know, we got arrested. They were caught. How's the easiest way to say that? They were, they were involved with the homosexuals. It's the easiest way to say that. You know, they, they were caught by the jail staff. Engaging in homosexual activity. You know, and they were in jail for, you know, killing a homosexual. I still haven't made sense about that one. They produce any evidence whatsoever from any source to tell you what happened out there that night, other than from the very mouth of the 17-year-old suicidal boy in jail. Anything? We've gone from no gun to a gun at the top of the hill that we dropped and ran back down away from at the first shot to now squeezing the trigger and firing around at Mr. West, but that was a result just of tensing up. He hadn't quite got to the truth yet. Now, as I said earlier, the jury is still deliberating. We have heard a rumor that the judge may let the jury have dinner at 6.30, then bring them back after an hour to continue deliberating. And of course, we'll have all the latest details as they become available to us. Okay, Two Diet Dr. Peppers, two regular Cokes, one Diet Coke, two Sun Kiss, two Dr. Peppers, and one 7 Up. They're expressing their individual opinions in the jury room. Either they're really split or... <laughs> right. I think there's some doubt right now, probably in some of the jurors' minds, from listening to um, the evidence, especially on the gun test, and um, that's probably going to uh, cause us to have a little bit longer uh, jury deliberations than in some of the previous cases where it was pretty clear-cut. Budweiser. I'll give that one to the judge. I ended up hitting too many cups. I needed a Dr. Pepper. One of the things about that courtroom is that the defense lawyer and the defendant are facing the jury the entire time. And they've been making efforts to maintain eye contact with them, and you know, that's what they should be doing. And I would, I would anticipate that there's just there's some maternal instincts are taking over. And uh, you've got some people that really think he's guilty but just don't want him to do the full 40 years. I blame myself for being that stupid. I mean, I was raised better. I should have known. I, I knew better. I shouldn't have known. I, I knew better. We can't show that he actually hit the guy, but there's really kind of a, a thin line between what he did and what they did. I'm hoping that the jury will say he's already gotten his benefit. Exactly. He's probably shooting at him and just missed. He's so petrified, he don't know what to do. He don't want to kill anybody. He don't want anybody to get killed. He doesn't know at that point that they're going to kill Wes. He, and when he does hear the gun go off, it's too late then. He knows these people are capable of murder. What is he going to do? Do you think he might walk out of here a free man? You never know. I've always been told to keep hope alive. You just never know. I mean, you know, anything's possible. they would find him guilty of capital murder, so I'm truly as surprised as uh, the gentleman over here. He's a murderer. He took Nicholas West from Bergfield Park at gunpoint to Montgomery Wards. Everybody here is familiar with that. They took him to noonday, stripped him of his pants, and laughed and joked about in his own video confession that he had defecated on himself because he was so scared. What does that say to the West family, a law-abiding, tax-paying citizen, members of the community, part of a church? What does it say? It doesn't say anything. Well, he's guilty of aggravated robbery, aggravated kidnapping. Uh, horrible crimes, and uh, I think the jury uh, made the right decision.
The defendant will have to serve a minimum of 30 years in the Texas Department of Corrections before he even becomes eligible for parole. What's your reaction, David? David, what's your reaction? I'm ready to go play golf. It sure is quiet out here, though.